Good morning, HVAC team. So today we will start week one of module 130, which is uh, basic electricity, motors, and HVAC controls. So we're gonna start off in unit 30, which is electrical safety. So let's uh, get into that. So chapter 30, electrical safety. The objectives are describe the harmful effects of electrical accidents, recognize the significance of proper electrical safety procedures, explain the function of ground fault circuit interrupters, determine if a circuit breaker has tripped and how to reset it, lock out and tag out an electrical circuit, test the circuit for voltage to make sure it is de-energized, Explain the safety importance of fuse and breaker amperage capacities. Describe, the, describe why electrical wire types and sizes are important to safety. So there's no excuse for poor safety practices. If a circuit is properly de-energized and locked out, then you will be safe. In the United States, electrical hazards cause more than 300 deaths and 4,000 injuries in the workplace every year. Electrical accidents rank sixth among all causes of work-related deaths. The Electrical Safety Foundation International recently reviewed data for a five-year period and reported that a total of 39, 39 of the victims were electrocuted while servicing HVAC equipment. Uh, you need to understand how important yourself or how important you need to understand how to protect yourself and the customer from electrical hazards, which is important. Electricity flow. Electricity needs a path to flow. Substances such as metals offer very little resistance to electric current flow and are called conductors. This is why electrical wires are normally made of metal, such as copper. Insulation has the opposite effect. It resists the flow of electricity, and this is why electrical wires are not just bare, but instead are enclosed by insulation that has a high resistance to electric flow or electricity flow. So you see here this red wire or this blue and possibly green and this white. That white, green, and red is insulation. Underneath that is a solid copper conductor, which you can see at the ends here. All three of these ends have this, these little copper tips. So that entire wire is copper, but it's wrapped in this plastic insulation. That's to protect uh, you from shock and then also to protect the system from shorts because you don't want these wires touching each other or touching other metal inside of the cabinet and then causing a direct short. Electrical shock. A severe shock can cause, in, uh, can cause internal damage. Destruction of tissue, nerves, and muscles may not be intentionally or initially apparent. I can't talk today. Destruction of tissue, um, nerves, and muscles may not be initially apparent. A little better. Um, electrical burns can occur as electricity flows through the body. Seek immediate medical attention for severe shock or electrical burns. So to prevent the possibility of electrical shock, circuits should always be de-energized before starting work. Always assume there is voltage present when working with circuits having, uh, having high capacitance, even when the circuit has been disconnected from its power source. Before working on de-energized circuits that have capacitors installed, uh, have capacitors installed they must be discharged using a safety shorting probe. Um, so let me backtrack a little bit. So as far as working on a unit, de-energizing the system before you work on it is good practice, but in the midst of troubleshooting, you, you're not always able to have the system up. Like what I mean by that is, if you're troubleshooting, you need the unit on so that you can see where the problem lies. So you will have to have the unit on um, often. So you definitely want to wear gloves and use safe um, practices. But when you do have the system off in some instances, like with uh, systems that have capacitors, even though the system is off, you can still get shocked because those capacitors store energy. So 
I got a capacitor right here. So this is a run capacitor for a uh, blower motor. So this capacitor stores energy. So if you were to remove the wires from the motor, from this capacitor, these terminals can still shock you. I know from personal experience. So what you wanna do after you remove the wires carefully with your gloves on, you're gonna wanna take a conductor of some sort. Um, you know, this has got the nice red insulated handle, so I'm still being safe. And then also this has been de-energized. But anyway, uh, once you remove the wires, assume this is still hot, get you, get, get, you know, get, get you a screwdriver or something, uh, a probe of some sort, and then short it out. And what we're doing is we're touching the terminals from this side to the terminals on this side, causing a direct short, and we're de-energizing the capacitor. And now it's safe to touch and test. It. So that's how you de-energize a capacitor, by the way. But um, also, never assume that everything is dead once you cut the power off, because capacitors store energy. That's what they do. So you want to discharge the uh, capacitors before handling them. And then also, a good thing to do is have your meter always always have your meter present that's like your main your meter is like a, a third hand as a uh, as a technician when you're out there troubleshooting so if if the unit is off just confirm that real quick turn the breaker off and then check for power make sure that the breaker's not bad and sending power anyway so check for power before you assume that it's you know that it's completely de-energized just take a quick second to confirm that because you, you don't want to learn the hard way. Electrical shock. A person may become frozen. Do not grab the person. Locate the power source and shut it off. Use something that is non-conducting to push the person off of the electrical contact. So like if you happen to be lucky enough to have a big two by four sitting by, you can nudge them off with that because wood is non-conductive. Um, I've also been told to kick the person off of the contacts with the sole of my boot because the sole is rubber and non-conductive. So, um, you know, in a pinch, you can, you know, you can just kick them off of the circuit. But the ideal way to save your coworker or your buddy is to kill the power. Turn off the quick disconnect. That's the whole point of a quick disconnect is it's a, it's a it's a break in the power between the unit itself and the power source, which is your main breaker panel. So if your buddy's on the roof getting electrocuted and there's no quick disconnect and you got to kill power to that unit, let's say you're on the roof, roof of like a three-story building. Well, now you got to go down inside of the building, locate the panel, then locate the switch for that unit, and then flip the switch off. Or you could just hit the main and kill the power to that entire panel, but that's assuming that you're at the right panel. So quick disconnects are a code requirement for any unit that is more than 10 feet away from the power source. Because if you're more than 10 feet away, then that's too far to travel to try to figure out where the power source is while your buddy's over here getting electrocuted. So um, you have to have a quick disconnect. And that is basically a, a source of being able to disconnect the power from the power source and save your buddy. Portable hand tools. Ensure that tools are properly grounded. The plug on tools should have three prongs. A lot of people ignore that third prong. This one right here, this is your ground. And when that breaks off, this appliance becomes dangerous because you no longer have that ground. So electrical injuries occur from the improper use of portable electrically operated hand tools. A ground wire from the three-pronged plug will direct the stray current to the ground rather than through the person holding the drill. The ground provides an energy path, or sorry, an easier path for the electricity to take rather than through your body. So basically, so you're a conductor. We're People are conductors of electricity. So if there's, uh, if there's stray current, well, the electricity is going to want to take the path of least resistance. And that's the point of the ground. It's giving that straight current an easier path to go, to go through rather than through you. So when there is no ground, th then there is no path of least resistance. You're the only path. So it's going straight through you because you're the one making contact with the faulty equipment. And, um, and so 
definitely don't ignore broken ground prongs. Definitely want to be safe because once that electricity goes through you, it can be pretty bad. Uh, breakers and switches. Switches and breakers energize and de-energize circuits. Check the switch or breaker to determine whether a circuit is energized. In some, in some cases, uh, there may be more than one switch or breaker for a device. GFCI breakers. GFCI breakers are often used for equipment to be located outdoors in damp or wet locations. <clears throat> It is reset like any other circuit breaker. You will need to push into the off position and you should hear, uh, you should hear a slight click and then push it back into the on position and it is reset like, any, oh, sorry. And you will hear, and you will again hear a click as it snaps closed. The GFCI breaker also has a test button. When this test button is pushed, the breaker will trip and then must be manually reset. This type of breaker can be, pre, can be periodically tested in this way to make sure that it is functioning properly. Switches. So here's actually a picture of a, um, of a quick disconnect. So this should be located near the unit. And in the case of an emergency, someone's being electrocuted and you need to kill power, you could just reach for this box here and just pull that lever down, kill the power. And the handle on that lever is insulated. So that's what you want to touch. Because in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in an event where people are being electrocuted and things are going wrong, you might not want to touch the panel itself at all. You might want to just grab that insulated handle, flip it down, kill the power, save your buddy, and then figure out what went wrong. But that is a quick disconnect. And this is this is one as well, but this is uh, this is open, and this one is closed. So, uh, general duty switches are designed for use in residential and commercial applications. These are used for relatively light load applications, such as general air conditioning and appliance loads. There are several different kinds of these switches, and some will have fuses, and some others will not. A typical residential uh, safety switch is shown left. Unlike breakers that have a snap action, uh, switches may consist of a throw, sorry, a throw handle that engages blades and clips, sometimes called a knife switch, as, uh, as shown to the right. So when the, uh, when the switch is on, when it's in the up position, then these little blades here lock into the contacts up here. And then when you flip this switch down, these two blades come out of these contacts and opens the circuit. So that's how these work. And so this disconnect probably works a little differently. I believe this kind here, uh, well, probably it, it, they actually work pretty much the same. I can't see inside of this one, but I believe it's a fused disconnect. and when it's up the um you know something similar to this is happening where it's making contact and the the, uh, the electricity can flow through the fuse and then out to the load it looks like the line comes in and the load comes out here <clears throat> but um but yeah that that's how they work they just make or break contact allowing current to flow or to not flow Heavy duty motor rated switches are commonly found on motor control boxes and feeder boxes for refrigerant controls in large commercial systems. Arcing is more pronounced on, those, on these types of large switches. So a quick, uh, a quick break operation prevents an, uh, prevents an operator from closing and opening the switch too slowly. For safety, when the switch is closed, an interlock switch prevents the door from being open. The handle must be turned off before the door can be opened. When the door is open, the interlock prevents the handle from being turned on. So that's common in most disconnects. You're not allowed to open and close them while it's on. When it's on, you can't close it. I mean, you can't open it. And then when it's open, you can't turn it on. 
you you can like for purposes of troubleshooting you can open it and then in order to turn it back on while it's open you have to push the interlock in manually and then open it um it's not recommended to do that because it's unsafe but again as the technician uh we can't always be completely uh protected from electricity sometimes in order to find the problem we need the unit open and energized so um when it comes to troubleshooting sometimes we do have to do that so Always wear gloves, always be as safe as possible, and um, and keep your meter handy. Don't ever assume something is de-energized, confirm it, and um, and just be careful. Lockout tagout. In a residential setting, uh, the first step before beginning any electrical work is to turn off the power to the circuit at the service entrance panel. Any other safety switches between the service panel and the component to be serviced should also be shut off. Never assume that anyone knows you are working on the circuit. The customer should be informed that you are working on the circuit. The customer, uh, sorry, the breaker should be physically locked out. Attach a tag that includes your name, your company, why you have the breaker locked out, and the date. In the event that you do not finish the work and do not return to the residence, this provides information on who shut the power off and when it was uh, when it was secured. It is always preferable to physically lock out the circuit. Um, I don't have one with me at the moment, but uh, so on most disconnects, uh, there'll be a little ring. So like when you when you turn the switch off, there's a little ring that you can put your lockout tag out through so and all it is a lockout tag out it's just like this little plastic tag you put it through the loop you close it and then you put a padlock on it and now it's impossible to turn the disconnect back on because you have that lock going through that loop you know preventing you from being able to turn it back on and then you can attach whatever notes you want to your tag um you know for someone else to know what's going on or why the power's off but the point is no one can turn the power on until you complete your work so if you're in the attic working on something and somebody's walking by and see oh hey somebody left this uh, disconnect off and they want to flip it back on that's bad news for you if an addict still working on it so that's the whole point of the lockout tag i just to prevent someone someone that doesn't know what's going on from accidentally creating an unsafe situation for for you while you're doing your electrical work so electrical work is different from electrical troubleshooting <clears throat> and i mentioned that because i keep mentioning how sometimes you have to have the power on well that's for troubleshooting electrical work can be you know running new wires installing wire for your you know for your unit or or just installing the unit in general so when you're doing work yes power needs to be dead um, when you're troubleshooting is when power needs to be on because you need to find out where you're losing power in the first place so that you can you know pinpoint the problem and make the proper repair so just wanted to clear that up because i keep throwing that out there well sometimes you need power on sometimes you don't when do you need it on when do you not well you need it on when you're troubleshooting you don't when you're so let, let, let's put it into a scenario so um i'm at a service call and we're not you know their their, their system's not working so I need to go find out why. So I go out to the unit, you know, I turn it off from the thermostat. You know, I hear some things coming on, I hear the fan. So I'm like, okay, I'm starting my whole troubleshooting process. Um, I go to the unit, I open it up. Well, I need to have it on because I'm troubleshooting. So I need to pinpoint what's going on. And then let's say, okay, um, I found the problem. It's a bad door move. Well, now I'm no longer troubleshooting. I found the problem. Now I'm going to kill the power and I'm gonna do some work. I'm gonna actually change this blower motor. So I don't need the power on for that. So I'm gonna kill the power, do my lockout tag out. That way nobody turns it on while I'm in the middle of my repair. <clears throat> Put my motor out, change it out, do what I gotta do. Now that it's done and secure and I've done my visual inspection, everything's good, ready for startup, then I can take my lockout tag out off, turn the power on and test out my brand new motor. So I just felt like I needed to clear that up. Multimeters, this is your third hand. A volt ohm meter is also known as a multimeter. There are four category ratings. 
CAT1, CAT2, CAT3, CAT4. Um, used to test circuits to see if, uh, if they are energized. Always become familiar with the meter that you're using. Use a properly rated meter for the circuit being tested. So this meter is ugly. It's a Craftsman. Um, that is not what you want to use in the field. That's not what I have. I, I, I particular, particularly prefer field piece, but Fluke has been kind of known to be like the Rolls Royce of meters and you know testing equipment. But um, and they are good. I had a Fluke. I had a couple of Flukes that both grew legs on me and walked away. But um, but I'm a field piece guy. I got a nice field piece meter. You use it for troubleshooting everything. You're going to use it to test for power, to check continuity, to check for you know to to ohm out your compressors. To, to, to check the microfarads on your capacitors. Uh, I mean, for everything electrical, you're going to be using your uh, multimeter. You cannot be a tech without a multimeter. And you'll get one in your, your toolkit, so don't panic. But, um, but yeah, I just want to stress the importance of that tool. That is your everything when it comes to electrical troubleshooting. You can't, you know, you, you can't tell anything about a unit uh, electronically without a meter. Multimeters, uh, types of protective gear and tools. CAT1, protected electronic equipment. CAT2, appliances, portable tools, single phase uh, receptacles. CAT3, commercial lighting and equipment. CAT4, outside service uh, connections. So those are the different ratings. Testing the circuit for voltage with a multimeter. Test the circuit in the following manner. Make sure circuit is off and properly locked out and tagged out. Test the meter on a known voltage source. Test the circuit that is shut off. Uh, or test the circuit that should be off. Test the meter again on a known source. Rest or hang meter uh, instead of holding it uh, with your hands. Connect ground. <clears throat> connect ground test lead and then hot test lead. Remove hot test lead and then ground test lead. Keep one hand in your pocket to test for voltage set meter to DC or AC, depending on what you're working on. Use the proper scale. So why did they say put one hand in your pocket? Because you don't want to become part of the circuit. If you have both hands on the unit and 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 the, and, and you um, and you get shocked, the voltage is going to go through you, and I mean you're going to get electrocuted. If you got you got a better, you have a better uh, chance at preventing injury if you only have one hand in the unit. Um, that's 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 one way to do it. That that's the way that a lot of people are taught. Um, sometimes it's just hard to do so. A lot of the times you'll find yourself needing both hands, which again. I'll just remind you to wear your gloves, always glove up so you can have some kind of insulation between you and the unit and just and just be safe. But um, but yeah, that's that's one way of doing it. So rest or hang the meter whenever possible rather than holding it in your hands. Connect the ground test lead first and then the hot test lead. Reverse this procedure to do the opposite for removal. Remove the hot test lead first and then the ground test lead. Try to keep one hand in your pocket to lessen the chance of a closed circuit across your chest and through your heart. Uh, to test for voltage, the meter must be set approximately, uh, sorry, appropriately to read, the, to read direct current or alternating current. The proper scale must be used. When testing a circuit, determine if it is de-energized, uh, a reading of zero voltage is required. Non-contact voltage testers. So that some meters actually have that function on there, but some people have those little pocket ones, uh, like you see here in the picture. And uh, all you do is you just hold it up to a receptacle. You don't have to plug it into anything. You just hold it up to a receptacle and it'll beep and flash lights letting you know if there's uh, electricity present or not. 
non-contact voltage testers do not require physical contact with live current carrying conductors. This type of voltage tester works by detecting the electromagnetic field that surrounds a live conductor. Uh, when using this type of voltage tester, you must still follow the same four steps outlined for testing a circuit with a multimeter to ensure that the, the, the non-contact voltage tester is working properly. So sometimes you want to test your tester. So uh, if it beeps when you, put your, when you put it up to the source, if you want to confirm that, you can pull out an actual multimeter and test the same source for power. Fuses. When a fuse is blown, it must be replaced. Plug type fuses generally have an indicator that will allow you to visually determine if the fuse is blown. Uh, if the fuse is of the cartridge type, often the uh, only way to determine its condition may be to test the current with a multimeter. However, some cartridge type fuses have visual indicators. Uh, to replace the fuse, always de-energize the circuit first. Turn it off. Always use a plastic or fiberglass style fuse puller for removing, uh, for removing and installing low voltage cartridge fuses. That would be this guy right here. Used to have one, do not know where it is, but it's non-conductive. So when you're reaching in panels and pulling out fuses, this is the safer way to do it. Um, a lot of the times, when you kill the power, the load side of your panel or your disconnect will be de-energized, but the line side will still be hot. And that's when it gets kind of dangerous, which is why you want to use something non-conductive. So this is the cartridge type. There's a little indicator in here. There's like a little fuse link and you can see when it's broken. A lot of times there is no indicator on there on these, on these cartridge type fuses. It's just that little cartridge and if it's it, it, the only reason that you know it's bad is because your system wasn't working so then once you found out that you didn't have power you had power coming in but you didn't have power coming out that's telling you okay something's probably wrong with this fuse so you want to grab your fuse puller pull that fuse out and then you're going to do a continuity test across that fuse to see if it's um, if it's any good or not and uh if it's bad you toss it and you replace it it's that simple and then these are these are old school fuses and there's an indicator on here as well you can see in there um, when the fuse is bad because it, it'll be the same thing it's like a little fuse link in there that will be broken circuit breaker and fuse sizes the current carrying capacity of a fuse or breaker is an essential safety factor fuses and uh, circuit breakers are designed to open and de-energize circuits in the event of an uh, overcurrent situation. Um, I wanna grab, a, there's one right there. Let me grab a fuse. So I don't have a cartridge fuse with me at the moment, but I do have one of these little bus fuses. So these are the kind that you'll see on the, uh, like on your circuit boards. I'm gonna get rid of the screen share for one second. So you can see if you look closely, that's a bad fuse. You can see a tiny little burn mark in the middle there. But what I really wanted to show you was that number. I don't even know if it's focusing on that great. You see a three on there? That means this fuse is rated for three amps. Here's a breaker. This is a two pole breaker. Right here on the handle, you see a 20. Every breaker tells you it's uh, amperage rating by that number on the handle. So this is a 20 amp breaker. 20 amp breaker, three fuse breaker. They both work the same way. Uh, sorry, three fuse. 20 amp breaker, three amp fuse. I'm getting a little tongue twisted here. Um, so on this particular fuse, current comes in the one side, passes out, through, it passes over to the other side, completes the circuit. And if anything more than three amps, 
travels through this fuse. It's going to come in one side and it ain't coming out of the other side because this little fuse link on the inside is going to break. It's because it, because it, it's set to break at a certain temperature. And um, so when it gets above three amps, it's going to heat up and it's going to burn that fuse out. And it's not going to allow more than three amps to pass through it. This is an overcurrent protection. Same thing with a breaker. Power comes in from the source and then it comes out to your load when it's in the on position. But if more than 20 amps tries to come through here, it's gonna trip and it's not gonna let 20, 20 it's not gonna let more than 20 amps come out because it's a 20 amp breaker. Anything over 20 is an overcurrent situation, and that's gonna possibly damage the load that this thing is uh, connected to. So that's the whole point of fuses and breakers are to protect, um, you know, to protect your load, but also to protect you from, um, you know, f from fire hazards. I mean, electricity uh, generates heat. I mean, too much current going through a conductor, it'll heat that thing up. It'll melt the insulation. I, I'm, I don't know if you've seen, you know, burned up wires and things like that, but that's, that, you know, that comes from overcurrent situations and it can catch whatever's near it on fire, possibly burn an entire house down. Electrical fires happen. And um, so anyway, so breakers and fuses are there to protect uh, from overcurrent situations. And if you, when you replace a fuse, you absolutely must replace the fuse with the same size fuse, meaning this three right here. If you, if you don't have any that say three, but you found a bunch of them that say five or 10, and you're like, oh, okay, well, whatever, it fits, so put it in. That is a no-no because it's supposed to prevent overcurrent. And now you're deliberately allowing more current by putting a five amp fuse where a three should be. So now, instead of killing the power when more than three amps comes through, it's gonna allow up to five amps to come through. But that's a three amp, you know, circuit. So now you're gonna, you know, possibly damage your circuit board. Or, you know, the same with your breaker. If you if you don't have a 20 amp breaker, but you got a bunch of 40s in the truck and you throw a 40 on, that is not safe. That's unsafe practice. In a pinch, you could maybe go under, but you could never go over. If you don't have any 20s, but you have a 15, you can get away with a 15. But that's not recommended either because you can have a bunch of nuisance calls where that 15 keeps tripping and you got to keep going back out. Probably won't happen, but it could. So going under isn't really recommended either. But if but if you if you're in a pinch, you can go under. You should never go over. Never oversize your breakers or your uh, fuses. Incorrectly sized circuits. <laughs> too much current can lead to a hot. Uh, can lead to hot and overheated wires and possibly fire. Excessive current can lead to equipment damage. Too little current can lead to nuisance trips and problems troubleshooting the trips. So there you go. Electrical wire sizes and types. Cable types, type NM, type UF, THHN. Uh, type NM, non-metallic sheathed cable widely used for branch circuits and feeders in, in residential and commercial systems. Flame retardant moisture, uh, flame retardant, sorry, moisture resistant, suitable for dry locations only. Type UF, underground feeder cable, sunlight and moisture resistant, suited for outside use, can be buried underground. THHN, thermoplastic high heat resistant nylon coated, suitable for dry and damp locations. And then you got your different sizes. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this a little bit bigger to point out something. So in the classroom, we use uh, on our thermostats, you'll notice we have 18 gauge wire. That's not even on this chart. It's, it's even smaller than this. But the 18 gauge wire we use on thermostats because we only need a very small amount of current to operate the thermostat, uh, you know, a 24 volt thermostat. Um, but you'll notice, so AWG stands for American Wire Gauge. So you'll notice 
um, 14 gauge wire is a lot smaller than 30 gauge wire. So the, I mean, sorry, I said 30, three gauge wire. So the bigger, the higher the number or the larger the number, the smaller the wire size. I don't know why it's that way, but it just is. But so, and they all have different amperage ratings. So a small little 14 gauge wire can carry 15 amps safely. And then let's say an eight gauge wire can carry up to 40 amps safely and so on. So that's the way the wires are sized based on the application. Um, you don't always need, like again, with the uh, thermostat, for example, you need a small amount of current for a, um, to operate a thermostat, but then you would need, you know, 200 amps to operate, you know, like a large commercial unit, you know, so it just all depends on, on the application or on the, uh, the load. I gotta find my way back to where I was. Here we go. So the smaller the number, the larger the diameter of the wire. Wires larger than one gauge are designated as zero, 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 and zero, 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 zero. Always refer to the requirements of the local building codes for the location where you're wire uh, where you are working. Also realize that local codes change from time to time. So you must keep up with the current regulations or on, reg on, a, on a regular basis. I've been sitting here too long. So in summary, electrical work should be performed on systems that are de-energized and all powered off. Follow all safety rules and recommendations when working on electrical systems. Circuits should be tagged and locked out before performing any electrical work. After power is secured, Test the circuit again for voltage. OSHA has regulations regarding lockout and tag out of equipment. Follow these and all other electrical safety practices. So that is it for electrical safety. I hope that was helpful. Um, like I always say, that goes in conjunction with your book. The book definitely goes a lot deeper. So read chapter 30 and the review questions will be on FlexiQuiz soon, so uh, prepare and, um, and have a good one.